Good. So I'm I'm uh, so uh, I'm at Argon National Lab and the University of Chicago, um, and we've got a, all sorts of things going on that relate to most of what Jing uh, said described here. Of course, not to say we've solved the problems, but we're certainly engaged in addressing them. Uh, and I, what I want to do here is to uh, talk about. Um, at least some of the work we've been doing, and, and some of it touches upon integrating AI into research, research workflows. Quite a bit of it is just about how we implement research workflows um, so that AI or humans can, can run them uh, uh, usefully. And at the end, I, I'll, if there's time, I'll say a bit about some of the work we're doing trying to use generative AI methods to uh, enhance these uh, workflow capabilities. So this is a picture of uh, Argon, has anyone who's been here, anyone you should come visit? Uh, so the, the, some, the two interesting, actually there's more than two interesting parts of it to me nowadays, but here are two. So this is the advanced photon source, which is a, a high uh, energy uh, X-ray source, um, just being upgraded actually to increase its uh, brilliance by uh, like three orders of magnitude in some cases. Uh, and then on, over on the other, not just a kilometer away, or as I like to say, five microseconds, um, is the Argon Leadership Computing Facility, which holds uh, very powerful um, computers, uh, in particular, uh, the Aurora system that we're just bringing up at the moment, which has 64,000 GPUs and can uh, achieve uh, you know, 10 to the 18th double precision floating point operations per second, more, many more if you're doing uh, lower precision as you might be doing for uh, you know, various AI applications. That's my colleague Rick Stevens in there to, well, looking wise, I suppose. Um, actually, we, but increasingly we are deploying uh, other interesting uh, facilities as well. We're quite uh, involved in building out self-driving labs. Uh, this is a, this is a, you know, basically labs that are configured so they can be controlled by uh, computer systems and then linked to uh, you know, intelligent agents that can make sensible decisions uh, and learn from the results of one experiment and planning the next experiment. So this is, we have a small, uh, what we call our rapid prototyping lab where students work to put together um, experimental systems and then we deploy them across the, the lab in different places. So this is a, an example of our rapid prototyping lab. Okay, so um, Maybe, maybe one way of putting our, I'm going to talk about three things, so I've tried to express them in terms of goals. So, um, I mean, the first thing that has long been my interest, personal interest, is, is uh, reducing barriers simply to uh, our, that otherwise impede our ability to access uh, remote resources so that we can connect whatever resources we need together um, to address some problem at network speeds. That doesn't have much to do with uh, uh, AI. It doesn't have, it has a little bit to do with workflows, but I'll say a little bit about that. Then I'll talk about some of the work we've been doing building computational pipelines to link instruments with computers and AI capabilities. And then a few words at the end about uh, how I think these tools we're building allow us then to uh, build embodied agents that can then discover things perhaps faster or at least in different ways than humans uh, would do. So first of all, a bit about uh, data and computing. So we are uh, very interested in building distributed systems at scale. Uh, so why do we want to do that? Well, it's because the data that uh, people want to analyze is located in many places. Perhaps the instruments and the data uh, are uh, um, in, in different places, the computers that need, we need to use to analyze our data are, are remotely located. Um, so we're very concerned with this mundane but uh, important issue of how you connect together uh, the different resources that underpin uh, modern science. Um, and of course these are all, well not actually all, but many of them are internet connected uh, nowadays, so that's a nice uh, starting point. Um, but uh, what we've uh, been doing over the last uh, 10 years or so, actually starting in 2010, is working out how to uh, create and deploy local agents, compute agents, uh, storage agents, um, robotic control agents, uh, and other things that can be placed in front of any, essentially any resource and then 
uh, make them remotely accessible. Uh, and I'll, give an, I'll explain the scale at which we're doing that in a second, but it's uh, substantial. A and then equally importantly, working out how to use cloud services, uh, in our case Amazon, but it could be any other, to uh, I integrate uh, the, and enable uh, a, a global uh, view of the many agents that may be deployed in different places uh, for the purpose, uh, for example, of running workflows. And, uh, and all of this with a standards compliant security fabric, which I won't say much more about, but it's, it's, a, it's an essential uh, element, of course. So, um, why is this going through twice? Oh, that's interesting. Here we go. So, so it's just to give you a scale of, some sense of scale. So this, uh, these services are what we call the Globus uh, services. Um, we've got half, close to half a million registered users at this point. Uh, 1,600 institutions deploy this stuff. University of Michigan is one of the, one of the most ag aggressive uh, and uh, intensive uh, deployment uh, institutions. Uh, there's you know, close to 10,000 uh, storage sy compute systems around the world that are connected, uh, 58,000 uh, connected storage systems. So it's, it's, and I recently counted the number of countries, I think it's up to 162 countries are involved. So it's, it's really this goal of providing a universal substrate for science is something that we seem to have made some good progress on. And uh, what does this have to do with uh, workflows? Well, um, once you uh, have uh, these little services deployed that allow you, you to access any storage or compute system that you're authorized to use in a uniform manner, then you can start running uh, flows of various sorts, and you'll see many of these little. Uh, oh, I bet this has a. Yeah, you'll see many of these little uh, list, uh, linked sets of uh, circles throughout this talk. But these are this you know symbolizes symbolizes a flow that perhaps uh, retrieves data, uh, does some uh, computing, uh, perhaps. Uh, runs, a, I don't know why we've chosen this logo, but perhaps runs a robotic experiment, uh, catalogs data, uh, and then shares the data with others. And uh, tick, 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 we can do those, those uh, series of steps on resources that may be located within a single institution or across many institutions. Uh, and uh, furthermore, we can do these things uh, in, a, in a trusted uh, manner, thanks to this uh, federated integration. Um, uh, in federated federated uh, identity and access management. And the, the, so most of you probably don't have to think about security except you don't want it to be broken, but the hard and interesting part about uh, security in these federated computing uh, workflows is ensuring that uh, managing delegation of rights, basically. You want to allow a person running a workflow to securely delegate to programs that they're running the right to do certain things, whether it's to control a robot or to uh, retrieve some data from a data store or to perform a computation somewhere. And it uh, turns out with modern security technologies that isn't too hard to do if you have the right uh, infrastructure, which we do. So when you run a flow, one of these things, we're busy, uh, under the covers, we're busy passing little credentials around that let people do exactly what you've authorized the programs to do, but no more. So that's important. Do I have one more? Oh yeah, so and just to give a scale, another sense of scale, you know, we've got uh, 1,800 identity providers linked into this uh, global auth authorization and authentication fabric. So most US universities, many, many uh, overseas, and we're running at pretty large scale. You know, more than a billion access tokens have been processed uh, so, so far. Okay, oh, and so I, I spent some time last year making a, a video, and I wanted to uh, take a second to run it here. Let's see if I can make this work. Is it running? Uh, I think I can make it go. Oh yeah, it's working. So this is a just to give a sense of the scale at which people share data using uh, the, this Globus technology. So this is, um, a, I think, a fun graph, but somewhat complicated. So these are transfers going on. Um, this is the date. We're starting in 2010. Each of these dots shows a, a, a transfer of this amount of data up to, say, like a petabyte, some of the big transfers. 
and the distance that it's been transferred. Uh, obviously, lots of transfers that are not going very far. Many, some going a very long way, almost all the way around the world. Not many going about 5,000 kilometers. So why is that? Because the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean get in the way. Um, and uh, over time, more, of them, more and more of them going faster and faster. You know, this is the speed. So getting up to many gigabytes per second. So uh, it's a, uh, at least I like this picture, partly because it, I think it catches the notion that you know, after, at least for the older among us, it used to be very hard to move data. We can now move vast amounts of data at very high speeds, uh, essentially anywhere in the, in the planet. And that is a fundamentally new capability uh, for, for science and something that we seek to take advantage of. Anyway, so given this uh, substrate, what do we then do with it? Um, well, one thing we do a lot of at Argonne and, and Chicago is to connect, uh, lo to perform, build workflows that we deploy that connect local instruments to local computing and local AI agents in order to enhance the capabilities of scientific instruments. So this is the advanced photon source that I showed earlier. Um, this is a, it's got you know, some 60 beam lines. Each of these little things here is a separate experimental station that at which people can put samples that get illuminated with uh, a high uh, brilliance and high energy uh, x-rays. And uh, back in the day, people would come to Argonne, they'd bring their, I think they actually brought floppy disks and then they brought uh, you know, DVDs and, and USB sticks. But now mostly what they, they still come to Argonne sometimes, but they uh, almost always move their data um, over the internet. And because every beamline essentially has got Globus endpoints deployed on it, so it's easy to program the movement of data in and out of these beamlines. Um, and then increasingly they also don't just uh, put the data on, send the data home to analyze, they perform an analysis during experiments and partly so that they can respond to uh, interesting events that occur as the experiment is proceeding and partly because um, they uh, uh, partly because they, they, well, they want to be able to detect when something went wrong, they want to perhaps be able to uh, uh, build workflows that will uh, track what's happening and, and act differently depending on, on what uh, uh, data was observed. So increasingly they run workflows, and I'll give you some examples. This is a very simple one, I guess, that uh, you know, take data from beamlines, move it to uh, some computing facility, uh, often on site, but not always, perform uh, analysis there and then go back and control these beamlines. So we've got to sort of turn this passive just data generation engine into a, a smart, a whole series of smart instruments that can engage uh, in useful ways with what, what's happening. And I'll give you uh, a few examples. Um, so let's see, this is uh, one that uh, is involved with uh, runs a, a technique called X-ray photon correlation spectroscopy. Um, so and this is sort of one of dozens of such flows, but let's see, you know, here they, they've deployed one using our Globus flows technology that as data is generated at the beam line, it automatically um, uh, performs some XPCS boost analysis, generates correlation plots, extracts results, uh, aggregates metadata, uh, publishes the metadata into a so as, a, as, an execution, as an execution, as an experiment is running, we get a series of data sets being published. Um, people can actually repo, reprocess pub data sets uh, with um, different parameters easily. And, and then uh, you know, we can also extend this to provide feedback to uh, alter the experiment uh, parameters. I may have an example of that uh, in a second. So this has now sort of become quasi-standard technology at this, at this at the advanced photon source. Um, and this is reprocessing uh, again. Uh, this is, uh, there are, these, these things won't mean too much because they've all got very fine font, font but you know, each of these is a different experimental pipeline uh, deployed uh, at a different um, uh, a advanced photon source uh, beamline. Okay, so uh, so here we're running things, uh, actually in every case I think we're 
performing analysis either at, on computers at the advanced photon source or you know, that one kilometer, five microseconds away uh, at Argonne Leadership Computing Facility. Um, but uh, increasingly, for various reasons, people want to run things uh, remotely, um, sometimes because computers are not available, perhaps because there are specialized capabilities at a remote site that are not available locally. So uh, it's uh, straightforward, as we show here, using these workflow tools the, to uh, simply dynamically select where you want to run an analysis. This is uh, Argonne, and this is at Lawrence Berkeley uh, National Lab, and it will run at one place uh, or, or the other. Um, we're also performing multi-facility uh, analyses of this sort in other contexts. See, here's, uh, this is an example from a totally different field, climate data analysis. So here there's no instrument involved, rather humans are choosing a data set that they want to analyze. Um, in this case, from a collection of climate simulation data sets, and then uh, dispatching the computational task to wherever uh, it may be that um, resources are available, or perhaps where other data are available that we want to, want to analyze. Okay, uh, oh, one more example. Um, as you probably know, fusion is the energy source of the future. Um, some people, people say it will always be the energy source of the future. That's a, but uh, we do work with some people uh, developing, uh, in, you know, designing and, and running, uh, designing experimental facilities for fusion and actually running experiments. Uh, this is the D3D um, facility at General Atomics. Um, and uh, they also have uh, deployed these technologies to allow for experiment time analysis of data and response to, to uh, observations. Well, let me, uh, have I got a, yeah, so I wanted to give you an example of how people actually, why and how people want to compute remotely when they're doing AI enhanced uh, experimental data analysis. So this, we've been working with the uh, the National Synchrotron Light Source, or sorry, the LINAC Coherent Light Source uh, at uh, the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center, or SLAC. Uh, and they, um, they uh, 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 one of the experimental mod modalities they use there is high energy diffraction microscopy. Um, so you, uh, you're shining bright x-rays on a piece of material. You uh, do some fairly computationally intensive analysis to detect uh, peaks in, in, your, in your data, and then you, based on that, you may choose to continue your analysis or to continue your experiment or, or uh, perform uh, analysis elsewhere. So one problem they find is that the computationally intensive uh, part of this takes uh, a long time. It's minutes or many minutes or even hours in some cases. So they want to uh, replace the computationally intensive uh, traditional method with a AI surrogate, uh, a deep learning model that uh, provides a highly accurate approximation of this peak finding uh, system. Um, so a fellow uh, a colleague of ours, Zen Chang Liu, um, built a machine learning uh, process based on a, a series of deep uh, neural network methods, models, to uh, basically train on a, a set of existing uh, previous data for which we have performed conventional reconstructions uh, and then uh, deploy that uh, trained model at the beamline uh, for, uh, for processing of subsequent data. And this accelerates things greatly so they can really do real-time control. The, the only problem we face is that uh, as the experiment proceeds, the, the sample deforms, the, the model, the deep neural ne network model becomes less effective, so you need to retrain it. And retraining uh, on the GPU that is used to perform the analysis is expensive, it takes 20 minutes or so. Um, on the other hand, we have uh, at Argonne a, uh, an, a, a Cerebrus CS2 uh, AI supercomputer that can perform the, the retraining in 19 seconds. Uh, so it's, um, it's a pretty straightforward thing to uh, configure these workflows so that they perform retraining periodically at, uh, at the, on the Cerebrus, redeploy the model, uh, the overall data movement and redeployment takes about 30 seconds. 
So you can do that uh, periodically while the, while the uh, model is running, you know, accelerating things by a factor of 30 or more. There are also some interesting issues here around, which uh, we, we have, I don't show here, but we have deployed of tracking over time how the um, model's performance degrades uh, and then deciding perhaps if a past model uh, can be reused or if past data can be reused to, to retrain a, a model that's better uh, suited to the current application. So I think I have a, yes, so that's the application, 31 seconds round trip. Uh, so this is, this is interesting, when we started uh, linking, uh, just sort of as an aside, when we started linking instruments with computers, initially we, our goal was to enable very rapid analysis of the generated data using the traditional reconstruction <coughs> methods. And we might allocate you know, 10,000 or 60,000 cores on our supercomputer to do the analysis in sufficient time. But now we've realized that well, it's not very scalable. Uh, if you've got 60 beam lines you, and other, many other instruments, you can't do that on a regular basis. So now the mode of use typically is you use the supercomputers uh, to train machine learning models periodically, and then you deploy those models to uh, either a smaller computer at actually next to the instrument or some other system nearby. So I think that's a, an important change in, in how we uh, it's a way in which so-called AI methods, machine learning methods, are changing how we make use of um, advanced computing to, uh, to uh, in enhance uh, instrumentation. So uh, a few words on the sort of implementation side. So if you think of this as a smart instrument, uh, you know, and it's got actually a few different flows. Here I'm showing the... Uh, the simple flow that is involved with uh, retraining the model. There's also an inference uh, you know, flow that does things relating to performing the trained model to each successive data set and verifying whether it's still performing appropriately. Um, but you know, how do we go about developing these, these things? Um, and it's, we've developed a pretty uh, straightforward sort of re re repeatable uh, process. So you know, typically we, we first of all find the uh, the patterns that we see in our application, and here they might be you know, data collection and transfer, AI model training, AI model deployment. Um, then we uh, assemble uh, simple implementations of each of those flows. Often we can reuse an existing one, uh, map each element to the suitable resources, and there, of course, we take advantage of this uh, universal data and compute fabric that I talked to at the beginning, so we can reposition things in different places. Uh, and then we, uh, th we, then we can run things. And this uh, translates ultimately into uh, Python code. One thing I was surprised, maybe, I suppose I was surprised to find when my daughter did undergraduate computer science here. She, everything was in C++. And I said, are you going to learn Python sometime so you can do useful programs? And she did eventually, but I realize that represents a difference of philosophy. But for science, you know, Python is often uh, very appropriate. So we, we build, we can provide these simple uh, pi pipelines that we instantiate the, doma the app domain. This is a simple pipeline, uh, you know, the, the code for a pipeline that runs a a few different tools uh, and deploys them on some suppl supplied uh, compute endpoints and uh, transfer uh, endpoints. And uh, for a particular application, we instantiated this template with the uh, the tools we want to run. Um, this is, I think, an, this is an XPCS, uh, X-ray photon co correlation spectroscopy application, and where we're going to deploy them. Uh, and then we're off and, off and running and we can uh, you know, tra track things and see this series of steps that uh, occur as the application, the application runs. Uh, determine when things fail, diagnose the causes of failure. Um, and, and so this is a, this is a list of uh, some of the pipelines that we've built for a whole series of different uh, photon source uh, X-ray source applications, synchro synchrotron crystallography, typography, high-energy diffraction microscopy I've already shown you. Um, synchrotron crystallography is pretty interesting. That's one that's, uh, it's, a, it's a new approach to 
to uh, determining the crystal structure of, of uh, proteins using very small crystals rather than the, uh, the large ones that people have historically used. And actually, I think I've got a slide on that. This is, might even be a, a video, let's see. Yes, it is. This is what, it, as, so you've got all these little uh, holes here. Each one of them has got, uh, well, many of them have some uh, protein crystals and it's zooming across them one by one, zapping them with the X-ray source and then looking at the resulting uh, output data uh, and assembling all of the output data from the different uh, wells uh, to uh, come up with an estimate for the crystal, crystal structure. So it's a very computationally intensive uh, but uh, effective technique that doesn't require such large, large crystals. Okay. Oh yeah, and this is uh, another representation of the flow that's being deployed for this thing, so which is, well I won't go into details, but it's, this is another way of representing what's up here. And these are some of the uh, structures that they generated. This was during the COVID, uh, um, COVID pandemic. So they, the, the interesting thing they did here was determine some structures of COVID proteins at room temperature rather than as was typically done at, uh, at uh, cryogenic uh, temperatures. Okay, more detail. Um, maybe I will skip that. So, okay. Uh, well, let's see. Oh, one thing I'll mention here is, uh, as all of these applications that I've mentioned, they typically uh, will typically include somewhere in their uh, in their flows. There's a publishing a publication step. Um, so people talk a lot about fair data, of course, in science at the moment. Um, and the, the only surefire way to get, your, to get data recorded in a reliable manner is not to let people do it, but make machines do it. So you want to, uh, we've, we've, it's becoming a, broadly a, a, a standard practice that when we run some instrument uh, data analysis flow, uh, the publication is automated so that the data produced, the reconstructed data, uh, is made available uh, in a computer accessible location with uh, associated metadata. Much of that can be computed, some of it has to be provided by, by the user. And so uh, obviously our user interface uh, skills are somewhat lacking still, but uh, you know, this shows you, uh, I think, uh, yeah, this is the serial synchrotron crystallography uh, we're searching for uh, data sets of a certain site, size, we, site type, and we can quickly uh, locate them either interactively like this or you, by using a, a program. And uh, well, so, so the, I think this is a broadly applicable lesson um, by automating in this manner. Um, and uh, in this case, in this particular application, there's no, they're not particularly using AI methods or machine learning methods, but in others they are. But the general thing is we're able to accelerate the discovery process by, in some cases, orders, orders of magnitude, simply by ensuring that uh, results are provided uh, as soon as data is collected rather than after some extended, uh, extended period. Okay. So we're also applying the same techniques to cryo-EM um, uh, imaging um, and to many other applications. Um, the, the techniques are in a sense, uh, the, sub, the substrate, the infrastructure involved is similar even though the imaging modality is, uh, is quite different. So another thing that we're uh, interested in um, here is, yeah, oh sorry, do you have a question? No. I wonder why it did. Yeah. It's a glitch in the matrix. So, um, so, uh, so everything we've talked about here has involved um, linking conventional instrumentation with, uh, with computers that run simulations, AI models, uh, or other uh, activities and then and then with uh, storage systems to automate the publication of data. We're also uh, doing, uh, starting to link um, 
these sorts of flows increasingly with uh, computer-controlled um, laboratories, uh, self-driving, so-called self-driving laboratories. Um, and uh, I'll show you just a, a few of these, the things that we're doing here. So this is uh, a system at the advanced photon source where the actually very clever instrumentation has been deployed at a particular advanced photon source, advanced photon source beam line. Um, so that, uh, well, with most of, most of this is sort of the, any robotic person here would say was so, so trivial uh, that I wouldn't even give it to an undergraduate probably for a class project, but it's been very effective uh, in, in the lab where uh, they're running using a uh, robotic arm to repeatedly uh, place these uh, pipettes in what they, they, basically what they're, it's a very interesting idea. So you want to image uh, behavior in, in liquids without using containers. And so what they do is they create droplets at the end of a pipette and then image the, in which the, you know, some activity is taking place and then they image through the, through the droplet um, in order to determine uh, you know, whatever it is that they want to, to measure. And that avoids, there's a droplet here, the, the, the green thing. It, it avoids a, a lot of otherwise uh, uh, unhelpful interactions that could get in the way of, of measuring what you want to measure. And of course our actual, uh, the control here is, is um, not very sophisticated. It's simply picking up a pipette, disp dispensing liquid and so forth. The, the autonomous discovery part comes in choosing what liquid to, uh, to sample next in, in, as you seek, for, seek to uh, determine some physical process or, 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 pheno or phenomena. And that's sitting behind the scenes and deciding what, what to do. Uh, here's a, uh, the, the, I think I mentioned this, our rapid prototyping lab has uh, a, a lot of uh, sort of fairly consumer grade uh, uh, lab equipment, open trans systems, uh, robotic arms, and we're using this to do uh, various uh, experiments um, in uh, biology uh, in particular, and some materials. Um, and uh, just as sort of fun, we have both the, uh, the physical equipment being controlled by these AI-driven workflows and the digital twin that allows us to verify how well things are going. The fact that the physical system is faster than the digital twin, I think, is just the uh, bias of the person making the videos. Um, <laughs> it's a, I'm sure it's actually much, much, much slower. If you look carefully, you can see what they're actually doing is mixing colored water together, because that's the only thing we're, we can safely do in our student accessible rapid prototyping lab. In a different part of the building, we're uh, mixing um, biological samples and, and uh, determining the effectiveness of different uh, antimicrobial peptides, but we can't do that uh, in, in, the, in the open space. Okay, uh, let's see. So, uh, how are we doing? Yeah. So, so, so far what I've shown you is uh, you know, very, very, very high level, um, what a glo global compute and data substrate, uh, a set of techniques that allow us to build on that substrate to quickly deploy applications that run these fairly, mostly fairly simple workflows that link, you know, instrument, computing, um, data, uh, et cetera. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, with AI uh, systems used either to extract meaning from data as it's generated, or to decide on the next experiment to perform, in which case we refer to self-driving labs or autonomous discovery. Um, something that now ties us into uh, recent developments in large language models and other uh, you know, generative AI methods is uh, work in which we seek to not just uh, have you know, static pipelines in which maybe AI machine learning is used to enhance one part of the pipeline, but systems in which uh, we have long-lived embodied agents that seek to uh, you know, discover things on their own. And I think we've got some talks that come after mine that speak to some of that as well. Um, so an embodied agent is, uh, if I look it up in Wikipedia, I'm gonna find something like this. 
uh, a computational system um, that uh, can interact with its environment. It could be a physical environment or a virtual environment. Um, some of you may have seen just the, earlier this week in the New York Times, there was a piece about uh, Anima and um, Kumar's work with uh, a, an embodied agent that learns to play Minecraft. It's a pretty fascinating uh, article. So that's a virtual environment. Obviously in our setting, we'll be more interested in the physical environment. A and then can learn over time from, uh, from, its, from those interactions. So we're interested in, I, I'm very interested in this question of to what extent can we uh, build systems of this sort that can undertake scientific discovery uh, processes. And one of the reasons for being interested is, apart from the fact that we've now got all many of our instruments and other devices universally accessible, is that large language models suggest that we may be able to build more, more rapidly build you know, quasi-intelligent uh, systems that can make uh, sensible decisions. So here's an example of one that uh, we're uh, involved in. I'm working with a fellow called Arvind Ramanathan at Argonne. Um, so he's interested in the, this, got what he calls antimicrobial peptide design. So um, you know, a peptide is, uh, an antimicrobial peptide is a you know, fairly short sequence of uh, amino acids um, that, uh, and people have found that they're, a, when appropriately designed, they can inter interfere with the functioning of certain uh, microbes. They, I think they penetrate the, I might even have a video there, do I? No. They penetrate the, um, can penetrate the cell wall and disrupt uh, what a microbe or a virus, in some cases, uh, is doing. Um, and so, uh, but there's a vast universe of possible antimicrobial peptides and little understanding of how they function. So, so uh, he's been building a system that uh, combines a, a series of what you might call agents. So, you know, finding, uh, well, first of all, you know, given a particular bacteria, what are potential pathways into the cell that we might take and what peptides might be possible candidates for undertaking that? Um, you know, given a, a set of possible candidates, uh, you know, which, what, what, tell me what we know, find out what we know about their structure um, and uh, you know, try to prioritize which ones for experiment. Um, you know, then uh, perhaps come along and design an experiment uh, that we could execute in order to test the performance of a particular antimicrobial uh, peptide. And the, each of these uh, things here might involve querying uh, PubMed, you know, pretty straightforward uh, thing we could do using PubMed as a large collection of, of uh, literature, so with ChatGPT or can be used for that or similar uh, systems. Then we may want to do some generative modeling uh, and even s computational simulation using, say, AlphaFold of possible proteins and their interactions. Uh, when we come to uh, wanting to design an experimental protocol, we might want to read materials from, read protocols from the literature and translate those protocols into instructions for our available uh, um, computers, so available instruments. And then we can uh, take a self-driving lab like the ones I've just sh shown you and perform uh, experiments. Uh, this is a, you know, an example of an experiment uh, that we execute using our technologies uh, in which you, a growth assay application basically says, well, what happens, how fast does this bacteria grow if you've dosed it with this particular peptide? And ideally it will grow less uh, rapidly. Um, and, uh, well, this is a particular experiment. I won't go into details, but, and these are the sequence of robotic steps that we're performing uh, automatically uh, using the underlying compute data robotic uh, substrate. And then once we've uh, finished this, of course, we can feed back to define additional experiments. So what, what are we doing overall here then? We're, um, well, we have uh, a computational system that's persistent and stateful. It has uh, some uh, n knowledge about at least what it's learned by querying PubMed and other databases about uh, proteins. It's, it's uh, got a set of hypotheses uh, about what may need to be investigated based often on uh, GPT or other similar uh, queries. It can interact with its environment by doing various things. It can 
run Blast and AlphaFold. They can query databases um, using various uh, techniques like uh, simple queries or retrieval augmented generation based on PubMed re retrievals. Um, and it can also control robots to initiate uh, and manage execution. Uh, and uh, of course its environment also includes high performance computing for doing things like uh, controlling, uh, performing AlphaFold simulations, data repositories to retrieve results of previous experiments. And uh, you know, the goal is that over time we'll learn new knowledge and new skills. So this is very much a, a work in progress. It's not like we've discovered, I don't think we've discovered anything new yet and haven't yet done anything that's too surprising for, for the biologists, but I, I think it's, at least I'm very excited about this as a potential path forward for how we uh, use some of the technologies I'm describing uh, and these new generative AI methods to uh, accept, well, create more effective scientific assistance, perhaps, that can do certain things that previously would have taken a great deal of human time, and maybe even in some cases act as my colleague James Evans calls alien intelligence, uh, you know, thinking of things that humans perhaps would not tend to have uh, thought of. So lots more work to be done there. Um, we're uh, hard at work on both at the low level, deploying these self-driving labs and building more of the, uh, this global data and compute fabric, extending it down to the level of individual uh, robots, and, and then at other and then working out how to build these embodied agents uh, that may be able to assist us in using this, under, uh, this substrate to do useful things. Lots of people uh, who work with me. Uh, this is a paper that I took the title of this talk from. It talks mostly about the underlying workflow stuff, and these are the people who worked on that paper with, uh, with us, but we also collaborate with many other people at Argonne and the University of Chicago and, and elsewhere. So thank you very much. Very nice uh, talk, Ian. I'm, I'm Alfred Hero from uh, uh, the National Science Foundation and, and University of Michigan. I had a, a, a question on the last part of the talk. Mm -hmm. um, I have other questions too. Yeah. I can deal with those offline. Um, it's becoming increasingly obvious that when you mix uh, design data from, say, a local test bed, uh, experimental test mm -hmm. bed, and found data from literature and the internet, mm -hmm that uh, problems can arise with yes. AI, uh, mm -hmm. neural collapse uh, mm -hmm. in particular, uh, where um, more and more of the, um, of the found data may have uh, questionable uh, veracity, validity, mm -hmm. or it may be synthetic data that is yep. redundancy, so the training set becomes yes. effectively uh, less rich than one mm -hmm. might expect. Right. Do, you, do you have any insights on uh, as we go into the future, how workflows uh, may be able to account for uh, this type of, uh, of, of dichotomy, yeah. dichotomy between uh, found data and design data. Yeah, it's a great, great question, um, and I'm, you know, I'm familiar with the. Oops, I'm teaching a class on large language models for science at the moment, and we've been just talking this week about these issues of uh, model collapse and, and, and so forth. Uh, I mean, I don't know if I have any profound uh, insights, except w we, we need to track very carefully the provenance of the data that we use to train our models and that we use as, we're, uh, as we um, you know, prompt the models. Um, and that's uh, not something that, of course, has been a, a focus at all of, of the large models that we've been using to date, right, in our, in the, well, that have been made available by our various uh, commercial uh, friends. Um, so we, we uh, at Argonne have 
with our new Aurora supercomputer, we're also putting together a consortium to build what we call Aurora GPT. So the goal is it's a model that's a very large language model uh, oriented to scientific applications and intended to, uh, you know, you know, oriented towards scientific applications. And that one thing that means is very careful tracking of the provenance of all the data that's used to train it. Um, so hopefully that will help. Uh, yeah, so anyway, yeah. we could talk at much greater length about yeah, that. We, that's we can one talk, we can yeah. talk afterwards yeah. about Yeah, thank you. Uh, hi, uh, wonderful talk. I really enjoyed uh, all aspects of that. Uh, I, my question is around if you have insights or, or thoughts on what types of data are, are consumed the most. I mean, you show data yeah. flowing back and forth. Uh, I'm, I'm a chemist, I focus on making mm -hmm. chemistry data, and there's, yes. there's a huge voice in our community to make our data standardized and fair, yes. and we're all working on that, mm -hmm. but it's, it's kind of hard to, yeah. to standardize there, but then I'm just wondering if you've noticed what data packages, like what structures of data packages or what ease of mm -hmm. user access to yes. them. Yeah, so the, this, uh, this is a thing I, I, I think about or worry about. Uh, so, so as I mean, this comes comes up, for example, in the context of this Aurora GPT. We want to include a large quantities of scientific data uh, in in the model, but what should that data be, and where should it come from? So, the biologists seem to have some fairly good ideas about this. You know, they say, well, we we have gained over uh, many years, you know, a large amount of knowledge about, for example, cellular metabolism and structure, and such that you know we've got these metabol metabolic networks that are known uh, to varying degrees, um, and that's information that it seems like we should be able. To, they say we should be able to load into a model uh, in a way that will allow it to the model to, you know, if you reason uh, over it. Uh, in the case of chemistry or materials, things are much less clear, I think, because we've got one. Well, of course, there are different species, but cellular metabolism is a fairly constrained. Very complex but constrained thing, but chemistry and materials are so vast in their scope. Um, I've been wondering what we would do to provide a similarly organized set of knowledge that these models could reason over there. Now, so in terms of what data sets uh, people make extensive use of, so of course there's uh, things like the materials project data, which I think some chemists would just look down upon because they'd say it's not actually data, it's simulated properties, which is you know, true. Um, but it is a, a large organized data set with you know, a fair bit of regularity and a great deal of variety. And that's uh, allow, has proved to be, I think, very useful for many purposes. Um, the question of how we take data that comes from you know, experiments in this lab, this lab, and that lab, and many other labs, and allow them to be combined is not so clear to me, and maybe here people have good ideas. We've been running a system called the Materials Data Facility for some years, and it has lots of data in it from many experimental modalities. It's certainly, I think, proved very helpful in terms of letting people get DOIs for their data, uh, digital object identifiers, so they can cite it and get credit for it. It's not clear that people are getting that much benefit from mining it and combining data from different sources, but maybe you you can tell me how to do these things. Or we can talk about it after the break, yeah. Well, thank you very much for the talk. Um, as an undergraduate, this is eye-opening stuff, especially mm -hmm. in regards to the future of the national innovation system. So it's, yeah. it's wonderful, thank you. My question is concerning uh, the instrumentation that Argon integrates yeah. with this system. I'm wondering whether or not there's been any work to account for uh, predictive maintenance in the uh, pipelines that you use? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, no, great question. Um, so certainly uh, at the, I mean, there's all sorts of instruments at Argon. The, the advanced photon source has a, um, you know, there's, they generate, you know, the way it works, it's sort of a, it's pretty, from a physical perspective, it's pretty fascinating, I suppose. Uh, where does it look? Where's it gone? Um, just for fun, let's find a picture. 
Too many slides. Oh, so yeah, so the, you know the way this works is they uh, they accelerate a, a, a beam of particles around here, and they periodically bend the beam. And when you bend the beam, synchrotron radiation is given off, and that's and they do that at 60 points or so around the beam. And so the people who operate the that the accelerator and the beam, they use, I think, I don't know if they use AI methods, but they certainly are doing predictive, they, they plan to, they work to detect anomalies and do predictive maintenance. The actual individual beam lines, I, I suspect, not, not, not so much, um, just because there's so many of them and they're mostly pretty low budget uh, operations. But yeah, I think we, that's clearly something that we could be doing a lot more of. And perhaps the, Hopefully the fact that we're starting to flow all data generated by this and other, many other things into uh, you know, standard locations will make that easier. There's fascinating issues around, uh, which I think relate here, was who owns the data generated by these instruments? Um, so uh, most data is not owned by the facility, it's owned by the people who did the experiment. And so you may not easily be able to combine, say, well, this, this you know, professor, you know, professor Joe's uh, experiment didn't work very well, Professor Jane's experiment did work well, and if we knew what they each were doing, then we could learn from the two of them, but the data is, is their own personal property, and that's a funny situation. Yeah. I just have a, have a follow-up on, on this general discussion um, that, that Tim Cernak uh, sort of opened up, yeah. and that is that um, uh, yesterday at NSF, it was, there was an internal announcement um, that the um, National AI um, uh, Research Repository is, is being launched, mm -hmm. launched as a pilot, and we're looking for, um, I don't want to say guinea pigs, but uh, um, uh, beta testers yeah. for this, and so um, NIH and NASA and DOE are, are involved mm -hmm. in this effort. Yeah. Basically, the idea is to pull together cyber infrastructure, uh, that's an NSF mm -hmm. word, um, yep. uh, for um, uh, data and algorithms and models uh, that can enhance the ability to, to mm -hmm. do just this kind of, of, of thing. Of course, there are, are issues of private data and, yes. and security and so forth. So, uh, you know, the, but the, the it will be a repository that brings together lots of uh, components of, uh, of data with, with so the technical support yeah. that's needed for people to have entry. And I mean, I think there's, uh, you know, we, uh, somewhat you, you referred earlier, I think, to found data, which, you know, of course, there are various sorts of found data, but one would be data coming from, you know, a thousand labs across the country. And to what extent will that be useful, I think, will vary greatly, but re remains to be seen mostly. Um, data that's generated uh, in an organized manner and method systematic manner um, can be far more useful. So everyone knows about AlphaFold, I think, you know, right? The AI folds proteins. Well, it's made po been made possible by the fact that labs around the world, but particularly Argonne and other national labs, were generating crystal structures over decades at high rates. So we have this huge collection of data that then could be used to train these machine learning models. Um, we need to be building similar data sets, I think, in other, other fields. And that's expensive. That's a, a challenge. Yeah. Okay. Um, actually, let me ask you one last yeah. question. Um, and also for uh, people like L2, which is uh, many places are putting in uh, similar efforts and mm -hmm. at different stages. And, you know, uh, f for example, this summer, University of Toronto just got a huge investment yes. from the Canadian government right. to build self-driving labs mm -hmm. for material sciences, right? And so among all these efforts, uh, given uh, some of the generalities mm -hmm. and also, you know, sort of a local, local requirements or features, I yep. wonder, um, in, in, I think, in general, how are you thinking about how different places learn, each, learn from each other at the mm -hmm. level of you know, hardware, software, yep. and also design principles? Yeah, so I was at, I was at this, uh, their, their mm -hmm. annual conference in, in Toronto and the, this acceleration consortium, and it was really a great exchange of information among people. I mean, I, I think the, so the, the future will, in the future, we'll 
you'll have individual departments or groups will have their little autonomous discovery system that's churning out data on some particular topic. But I, th I think increasingly, as in computing, we'll see bigger and bigger facilities that have you know, otherwise hard to access uh, equipment and you'll be able to ask this facility to generate data for you on some uh, thing. So hopefully we'll, of course, teach people how to run and build these small systems, but to the extent we can automate and centralize, then people will be able to u benefit from them and use them without having to becoming uh, instrument engineers, uh, as it were. Okay.